Sorry about this. No worries. So we are all here. And you can hear me, huh? All good. Yes. Super. So welcome back. Pleasure to see you again. Um, I realized, by the way, when going through the lectures which we are recording here in Zurich too, that uh, some of the lectures, some of the portions of the lectures are actually good, other parts are not so good and uh, also a bit repetitive, so sorry for uh, uh, the, the imperfection and I will try to um, not repeat myself so often. Um, but this lecture is actually very different. This lecture is now the first of the later three and is much more about how we work. Uh, so you now know the thinking of deep urbanism and then the question is always uh, so what do you do? And this lecture today is really practical work. Um, let's say, quote unquote, conventional work. And the other two lectures are then um, more specifically addressing the issue of deep urbanism. One will be about uh, um, digitalization and the other one will be about um, politics, participation, and so on, narratives. And when we work somehow, two things I keep in mind. One, uh, I told you about in the first lecture, which is this idea of, um, um, of uh, systems ecology applied to architecture and urbanism which has to do with an understanding of how uh, systems change over time. We saw that already in the first lecture that um, any kind of system, be it a natural system, be it a city, be it a company, tends to uh, grow over time, become increasingly connected, then reaches a tipping point, um, disbands again, becomes reorganized in the informal ways, so we have a lot of value but not so much connectedness, and then a kind of a new cycle starts again. For me, this is extremely helpful to think about um, work uh, also in this almost ecological sense, specifically when you then imagine that these, type, these types of adaptive cycles actually are um, nested into each other, both in space and in time. So you have systems which oscillate very quickly, maybe in a daily cycle or in a yearly cycle, embedded in systems which oscillate slowly over hundreds of years, thousands of years. And you have uh, systems on a local scale uh, which are embedded in system on uh, increasingly larger scales. And they all affect each other. Um, so, for example, it is interesting to imagine that uh, you have systems which are changed uh, by other systems on a smaller scale and a smaller time frame, uh, what is called here revolt. But revolt also could mean planning. It just simply means that um, you affect uh, a system on a certain scale in space and time with a faster system, so you could argue it's an actual revolution, but you could also argue it's, for example, a project team working on a project and with that fast and localized system affecting, for example, a part of a city, which is, of course, a slower and a bigger system, right? So it's, it's, it doesn't need to be a revolt in terms of revolution, it simply means a uh, smaller and faster scale affects a bigger and slower scale. And on the other hand, you have the idea of remembering things, um, you know, uh, where a larger and slower scale acts on a faster and smaller scale. Remembering, for example, um, uh, you know, a seed in the ground which generates a new tree after a bushfire eliminated the forest or it is uh, also monasteries remembering rituals ideas legal codes and so on from the roman empire 
but it might also be much easier things. It might be, for example, uh, that um, a larger scale in a city, um, um, for example, infrastructure is affecting the um, slower, sorry, the faster and, and smaller scale um, uh, also in the city. Then the other th uh, person which we met, uh, which I find extremely interesting as a thought model, is uh, Bolani in terms of his idea of the great transformation. So the change from a local embedded culture to a more connected, but inevitably also um, more abstract uh, culture uh, at the moment when we invented market society. Um, at the moment of scaling uh, of uh, industrialization. And here the term embedded uh, is, is a kind of a key term for me. So that means I think all of what we do as architects uh, is kind of spanning between the connected and the embedded. So connected means we are linked to larger scales also to faster speeds maybe. And at the same time, we need to make sure that we don't lose embeddedness. Or you could also call it, um, you need to make sure that local life and global access are working hand in hand rather than against each other. So when I talk about deep moves, what I mean is the idea to keep embeddedness as, as much as possible. So to keep the connection to the local, to the real, to the people in a particular place intact with uh, an idea of subsidiarity. So always try to solve on a local scale what you can and only go to a, more, uh, a bigger scale when you have to. Uh, it also has to do with a realization of path dependency. So as soon as you build something, uh, then it is built and a lot of options which you had before are gone. You know, every architectural wall also uh, basically encloses space, but also um, prevent, prevents other enclosures of spaces. So again, uh, the idea that we combine local life and global access. And this, you can, this idea of subsidiarity, you can understand in spatial terms, so that you are carefully connecting local environments to larger scales. Uh, for example, by well embedding infrastructure so that it gives you access to larger scales, but at the same time doesn't destroy the, 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 the smaller, more local scale. Uh, it also has to do with uh, mobility, that you always generate um, accessibility to larger scales. It has to do with economy, that you uh, generate opportunities, local opportunities, and it has to do with uh, politics that you allow for uh, kind of local participation. And what this kind of means in daily practice, uh, I'm going to tell you about in this lecture. So Switzerland, um, I already talked about it a bit, is of course this kind of hilly country in the center of Europe. Uh, this is um, not exactly the place where I spend my summer vacations or did spend very much as a child, but it's very close to it. So it's this kind of rolling green hills which generate these valleys. And of course, on the other hand, we saw already Switzerland is also linked to the urban system in Europe. Um, and you need to understand both of these factors in order to understand Switzerland. So the very local embeddedness uh, in these rolling green hills and the connectedness to a kind of a European urban system uh, acting with and into each other. The connectedness to the urban culture is of course important because it gives you also a, uh, um, an access to uh, European markets, European economy, European culture and so on. And therefore, so from the very beginning, the question was how these towns and villages and farms can link themselves with infrastructures to these larger systems. 
so from energy to mobility and so on. And very early on, people started investing in and building these um, infrastructures, for example, railroads. This particular railroad originally being built by private money because local industrialists wanted to have access um, to the Gotthard line, so to the north-south axis through uh, Europe. So you have these little houses and this infrastructure right next to it. And this is a kind of a first project I want to quickly show you, which is the railroad station of Herisau, uh, where we have the current state uh, shown here in this overview, and here the um, future state uh, we want to turn this um, place uh, into with a kind of a new station area here in the front, but also an area development where by reorgani reorganizing the actual station square and the bus stop and so on, we also generate opportunities to add additional buildings and therefore additional uh, urban development uh, on the site. Now, when working on the project, it's kind of interesting to look back um, around 100 years ago or 110 years ago, this is what the location looked like. On the right hand top, you have uh, the town of Herisau. This line here is the original train line. And the original train line had a, an end station, a terminal station in Herisau, sort of linking Herisau to uh, St. Gallen, the next um, larger city uh, in the region. But as I said earlier, for the, industrial, for the industrialists, uh, mostly invested in textile uh, industry, it was very important to have the link uh, to European markets. So they therefore were interested in having a railroad station, which was a through station, which continued further on. And for this, they basically had to lower um, this track, this single track, add tracks and link um, through the station over the bridge, which we have seen before, through a couple of tunnels um, to the main axis uh, through Europe. An achievement which they were, of course, uh, incredibly proud of. So this is in 1910, the opening of this new um, station and of the tracks which now linked this town in eastern Switzerland to much bigger infrastructures and therefore much bigger markets. But now again this infrastructure from 1910 has reached its limits and um, bus stops have to be organized better, um, the uh, disability access has to be organized better um, the entire logistical regime uh, in the station doesn't work so well anymore. So uh, the task was very much to turn this uh, very nice, uh, slightly sleepy, by now slightly sleepy station uh, into something new. We see here a bit how it is organized between this cliff, which has been generated by this earlier generation, digging down and laying the tracks uh, on this lower level, flattening out the hill and therefore ending kind of abruptly um, before the valley then goes further down. This was our competition model from, from uh, um, 2014, so quite a long time ago, where we proposed this kind of scheme. Have now developed this scheme further with uh, landscape architects, um, structural engineers, civil engineers, um, signaletics and lighting designers uh, into this concept of a kind of a concrete wood hybrid construction which allows us to do to make very large spans and generate this much more open, much more clear uh, organization. 
still referring to this um, old cliff, but um, organizing it more cleanly so that all the bus stops are now um, working around this central island, um, which gives us access to the trains, but also access to the bus and most importantly links between the two train lines. So this is the train line which spans uh, now, uh, which basically links the station uh, to the larger system. This train line here is a more local train line. And here you see how this uh, station now becomes reorganized more clearly, um, uh, orientable and so on. And of course also generating a very strong sense of place uh, with this very large roof. So the idea here is to connect, to basically improve again the connection the station has to larger infrastructure, but make very sure that while we are doing that, we are actually improving the local embeddedness. We are improving the local um, situation and the local uh, quality for the people. So here, the, um, the engineering uh, portion of it, where we have this concrete wood hybrid um, structure with a kind of steel cable running here in top the entire length of this 110 meter long roof in order to allow us this very big span of over 40 meters uh, here in the center. The span had to be this big because there were so many bus stops uh, which of course have uh, buses on them with doors where people exit and so on. So we needed to kind of absolutely minimize uh, the columns. So you see here a bit what this looks like. So also the idea of adding then uh, lighting, uh, skylights, so that the, the um, area underneath the roof is never dark but always inviting and um, well lit. And then we are also linking the scale of the station, you know, so from the north-south axis uh, through Europe to the regional train system, to this um, regional bus stop, to a local site, linking then this local site uh, to the village, um, so that people also really are able to use uh, this station well. Um, with a kind of a very filigree um, bridge structure and a kind of um, a floating spiral staircase uh, without any columns. The beauty of this is that the lower part of the staircase is actually a cantilever um, linked and embedded in the ground, then linking further up uh, to this point here, which is actually a, a kind of a pin joint. So here you see the system. And this then is the, the result, a kind of um, a station linked both to the world, but also to the town, thereby trying to bridge these different scales and at the same time still generating local quality. Then another project uh, is um, this project here, uh, which is a former metal factory, which produced a lot of the Swiss uh, classics, for example, the famous Lundy chair, top middle, um, which does not produce anymore right now. So, there are temporary uses now in these industrial halls. So where formerly you had people working, producing these metalworks, uh, it's now a lot more sleepy. Um, you have nature kind of growing in and industry almost completely receding, but still in terms of spaces being very iconic. And what we were tasked to do in this competition, which we won, was basically to turn this place um, into 20% um, still of production 
and commercial uses and 80% of housing and do that again in a way where we work with and expand on the established identity which has a kind of an, um, an, a town part which re resolve which comes from the industrial site you know orthogonally organized a bit more hard uh, and also able to uh, incorporate um, production and commercial functions, so this portion here. And another part which is kind of embedded into this green, more Arcadian portion of the existing situation. So thereby combining um, the original industrial hall of which we keep a part with new um, areas for retail, commerce and production and put housing on top around this small square with a high porosity also from the public street. Again here, the historic hall, um, which we keep and use for cultural events for a bit of production still, but also pop-up stores and the middle part as a kind of a winter garden or as a kind of a foyer for the entire site. And we link that to this green um, Arcadian park landscape in which then uh, the other um, housing parts are located. So also again here, very much working with the history of the site, trying to extend it um, both functionally as well as um, identity-wise. So never work with tabula rasa, but always keep the historic depth of the site, right? So the first project was about in infrastructural depth. This project was now about um, identity and historical depth. The same kind of historical depth we were trying to keep uh, also in this competition, which we didn't win, Herzog Dömerau won uh, it with a project which I don't like so much, but that's, that's the life of an architect you, you, you often lose. Um, but this is a, um, a originally a kind of um, a, a, a customs terminal in Basel, a logistics center rather. Um, and the question here was basically to uh, link this logistics center in the south here, which is changing rapidly, um, becoming more and more mixed use. Uh, there's a very nice project by BIG, so by Bjarke Ingels, uh, further to the south, to link this part uh, with this more traditional fabric uh, of the city uh, to the west here, left-hand side of the image. There's also a very nice historic cemetery uh, located to the east of our site. You see here also this, this kind of um, city grid uh, on the left and this kind of um, railroad track logic uh, to the side, to the south, which we had to link together. What we try to do is basically have here this kind of big retail um, structure which we needed to keep and add to and embed that into this local condition better, um, add functions on top of it. And now here we have this kind of transition element, the kind of um, perimeter block structure which we take from the existing historic portion and work with it uh, in a way where we still generate all of these uh, niches, but we add more volume uh, to these niches with, this, with these high rises, which you will see uh, in a second. And I think what you will see again and again in the projects which we do is this attempt of nesting spaces from the big idea of this larger kind of neighborhood to the public square, uh, which you see here uh, next to this uh, retail space, to these perimeter blocks with their courtyards, to then uh, the lodges of the people living here and so on, right? It's always the idea of nesting. So again, you see this here, you have um, 
the street grid from the historic part coming out, uh, generating here these um, public space, tree covered and very green. And here these smaller perimeter blocks um, with the green courtyards. Around the green courtyards we have in the front also commercial functions, in the back however housing oriented always, always towards the green, towards the inside because the street in the back is actually quite noisy. And then we add mass uh, to this perimeter block to um, fulfill the requirements of uh, the FAR floor area ratio which the client wanted from us. So again here you see this fractal organization of big idea, medium scale idea, small scale idea, all of them linked and nested together. So that they're always meaningful, the socially, the, let's say the, the, the uses and the different functions in terms of social spaces are always um, um, organized well. There's always, for example, a threshold from the public space to the more local uh, space and a threshold then from this communal space to the individual space, for example, by this green, then covering and protecting the housing behind it. So here again, you see this kind of fractal organization, this kind of nesting of scales into each other. So here in our uh, model. And then this is then the effect that you, now we are behind this first uh, row of buildings. We are looking here uh, along this inner axis. So on the right hand side, we have the interface between this collective space inside the perimeter block and then on the other side, the um, public space. And on the left, we have then the living areas protected by the, by the green courtyards and by the balcony zone uh, in the plinth area uh, of the buildings. This then is the public space. Again, you have the commercial facade on the left. You have a pavilion in the middle. You have the larger retail site um, on the right. And again, this uh, slab tower as a kind of a marker for the entire uh, area. And then here again, we are further out uh, in the system. So this is this larger regional road, again, uh, with a tram, uh, a louder. And this road then has addresses which are more regional addresses. On the one hand, the big high rise with a office plinth and a housing top. And here, the uh, addresses of this large uh, retail um, company. Also, again, this kind of nesting, this kind of nesting of spaces, addresses on a regional, on a, uh, on a neighborhood, um, on, and on a local scale. Same idea here, a competition where we won a portion of, but unfortunately not the master plan. But again, here you see this nesting of scales in a project uh, in Bern, where uh, the um, task was to add here a new uh, neighborhood and a new park. And um, the idea we developed was basically to bring this public road, uh, of course, on the one hand, along the site, but on the other hand, also into the site. So here it would become pedestrian. The reason why we have this gap here is because there's a large tunnel uh, underneath, so we cannot build anything here. And um, along this pedestrian line, you have on the lower part, the perimeter block with the courtyards and on the upper part, a more porous structure, which then allows you then to link to this um, public park. And on the other side of the public park, you have then these allotment gardens. Again, nesting of spaces, of addresses, of users, um, so that adding mass always also means adding quality, adding 
opportunity, adding niches and um, 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 spaces which actually are worth using. And then again, zooming in more, so what you see here is basically this portion uh, we took out and developed a bit more um, for a for one or two cooperatives. So this is cooperative housing. The idea of this housing is that we have fairly um, efficient um, volumes. Uh, for example, this point building here. The idea of this volume is that uh, the staircase is actually outside, is cold. And through this staircase, uh, which of course also has an elevator here, via these, um, in German it's called Laubengänge, probably in English you call them galleries, we access all of the apartments of this uh, building and also some of the apartments uh, of this building. So everything is linked by these uh, collective spaces. Um, all of them are organized around this collective garden space and that then again sits at this pedestrian alley which you have seen before in the master plan and is connected to the collective green uh, which is more public um, um, towards the um, upper part here. And this then, the idea of what it could look like uh, finally. Right, so again, a nesting of scales and users and functions from the neighborhood alley to a pocket square or park to a communal staircase where you have functions embedded in it. From that staircase you go to the galleries and from the galleries you go into your private house. And on the left hand side again a garden which is in partly which is in parts shared. Now, so this is, the, this is the general strategy. So always this nesting of spaces, functions and users. And I'm showing you now two larger projects uh, where you can see that you can also do that uh, in entire quarters, not only in area developments. Uh, both of these projects are first prizes which we won uh, in Hamburg. First the Hafen City and then a kind of um, uh, the Elbinsel Quarter here in Wilhelmsburg. Both are located in the estuary of uh, the Elbe River. So this is one river, the Elbe River, which kind of flows around this very large island, uh, which is located to the south of the city of Hamburg, which you find here. And this is basically, again, a story of a city which is linked here, Hamburg, which is linked into this European urban system. A city which uh, in the mid 19th century was still largely walled, but had already a quite a performative, well-functioning harbor organized here still uh, in this smaller portion uh, within uh, the city wall, but slowly growing beyond. Then here in 1913, you see how the harbor jumped out, how the connectivity to the world became increasingly important. And of course, uh, the harbor was very much the reason um, for the success and, uh, success and wealth uh, of Hamburg. So it was important to scale it up. They did this by leaving the city walls and going into the Elbe River. So you see here the beginning of the 20th century uh, what that looked like. And at that time, all of what you see here in the middle of the image was basically a forbidden city outside of the German custom boundary. And this portion here was, very, was a very large um, logistics area and storage area. So all of these um, buildings here are um, storage buildings, storing goods which came in from overseas. And 
you have here, of course, again, the links which are required, for example, railroad links which are required to operate this big harbor. And then uh, it became clear uh, at the end of the 20th century that the harbor again needed to be bigger because in the current harbor organization you could, you could not organize the big container shipping which was necessary to be competitive in an increasingly growing global economy. And at that moment, at the end of the 20th century, in a kind of a, a, a fairly secretive uh, operation, the city of Hamburg started planning for this future where the docklands would become available for urban development. They very cleverly bought pieces of land not yet owned by the city. And you have to understand that the city of Hamburg is at the same time also a province, a Bundesland, so they have quite some uh, political power. But they started buying this land and uh, Folkwin Mark, so from Gerkon Mark partner, made the very first sketches of what this city could look like. Uh, they then made workshops where a lot of international architects were participating and finally also competition which was won by KCAP, um, by Ostock and ASP architects um, 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 in Germany. Ostock and ASP are Germans, KCAP was uh, Dutch at, the, at that time. And with that of course then this transformation uh, which is now globally known as the Hafen City Hamburg um, started. You see here uh, the, the current model with this El Philharmonie by Herzog Dömeron in the front, our area which we won in 2015 uh, here at the very end, so uh, the, 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 other, the other side uh, of the, city, of the um, development. So this is the Hafen, uh, the El Philharmonie. And what is amazing is that in a very short period of time, this vision could become reality. So you have here the Hafen City 1997, still almost entirely um, um, logistical. Then here, slowly, uh, you have the first developments along the Kaiserkai. So these were the very first buildings. So this building here later became the plinth uh, of, the, of the Elf Philharmony. Today, um, this um, new um, part of the city of Hamburg is actually frequented very well. It's quite well uh, done. You have people, you have uses. And they did a couple of things incredibly cleverly. Uh, for example, very early on, they built the metro system. So what you see here uh, is actually a metro station. So the site today looks uh, very different. And um, the development tool and uh, company which basically was running the whole thing was the Hafen City GmbH. And by keep, and, and this is spe specifically, the Hafen City GmbH is a special purpose vehicle. So it's a, it's a company which, however, is fully owned by the city of Hamburg. And that company was able to develop almost like a private developer, this entire site uh, in a way where they were able to spend money on infrastructure early on and were then able step by step to um, amortize this very early capital expense uh, and specifically also um, step by step turn this whole thing into a business case in which the city then did not lose any money. So in the end, uh, this whole development basically paid for itself, which is quite, of an, which is quite an achievement and what you may know is that uh, in a lot of um, specifically Eastern European countries, 
Uh, this doesn't work so smoothly. So what you have there is that um, either the EU uh, or the public hand actually loses quite a bit of money with these developments, whereas the private developers usually uh, make money. But the, but the genius of the Hafen City project and of the Hafen City GmbH very specifically was that they could do this uh, in the end uh, all together with a functioning business case. And this again went very fast. So 2030 should see the completion of this entire project. Uh, so within 30 years, they turned these abandoned docklands of um, more than 150 hectare of land uh, into a kind of a well-functioning urban development, uh, which will have around 15,000 residents in the end, and a total investment of 13 billion euros, of which three are public, for example, the subway, and around 10 in the end will be private. So we visited the, this site first uh, in this uh, international competition in 2015. So this is uh, us and a lot of competitors basically walking uh, through the eastern part um, of the Hafen city. At that time, a kind of a wasteland uh, but a wasteland where um, the roads were, were already planned and partly built. So what you see here is the level of the future roads, which were more or less given. And the large empty area will be the future basements. And the roads were built so early so that the build-up could sink over several years to the level uh, which the roads finally need. So the whole thing is setting down uh, over many years and compacting itself so that when you then finally build the roads, they don't move anymore. And of course, at the same time, you don't need to excavate basements uh, when you are already uh, at the right level. And in turn, the roads had to be at this level um, 8 meter, 45 centimeters above average river level in order to be protected against um, high waters, against flooding, right? Flooding specifically also by the ocean uh, pushing water back into the river. This is then our uh, winning proposal. And again, here you see this nesting, right? So you have the large figure of the harbor basin, you have the public square, you have roads, you have smaller squares, you have courtyards, all organized so that both harbor noise and wind don't um, um, are so that they're not too problematic at the same time that the sun really is able to enter uh, these uh, courtyards and of course infrastructurally the uh, entire neighborhood is linked well uh, to uh, the U-Bahn the system here with a, with a station which is above ground and this is then the kind of the final um, result, also with the landscape competition winner uh, now embedded. It's organized um, around these um, plinths, a lot of which have um, commercial functions in it, so that this really becomes an active part um, of the city where people also really want to be, spend time. Um, in restaurants, in shops, or with uh, cultural activities. There are also two hotels planned. Above that you have housing in red, um, office space in grey, and uh, hotels and commercial functions in blue. And for us it was very important to structure the space with these gates, 
Therefore, we also called this um, um, our scheme the the Elb gates, so to speak. You know, wherever where where always you move from one scale to the next scale, so from one scale to the next scale, and therefore our nested system becomes readable. At the same time, it was also important that we link these scales. So for example, what you see here very faintly is a passage which links the courtyards internally. So the idea would be, for example, that if a kid lives here uh, in this courtyard, it can walk through here through a bit of public space and visit a friend who might live in the next courtyard. Right? So this, this, this nestedness has to do with generating thresholds, but it also has to do with generating links between these individual compartments, so to speak. And that generates us hierarchies of spaces. So from the orange, very public, to the increasingly more local um, space hierarchy, to in green, even more local neighborhood level, or then here at the courtyard level, which is then really um, increasingly privatized. Or um, here in a very early urban design rendering, maybe looking like this, versus a slightly more accessible scale looking like this. And then here, the larger scale of the Amerigo Vespucci square looking out into the harbor basin or the view back where you see the, <coughs> the um, warfed fronts. So again, uh, there might be moments when this level is flooded. The safe level is actually up here, 8 meter 45. And the Amerigo Vespucci square is gradually flooded because it's an inclined plane. And the other thing which was important for us was this almost scenographic um, organization, uh, you know, like you have uh, in, a, in a scenery, in a theater, where back here you have the deep part of the stage, and then you have these buildings kind of forming um, a kind of a series of um, um, receding planes, so to speak. And at the very end, you have the Elb Tower, which is currently being worked on by Chipperfield, which at some point might look like this. So basically, this is a 600 million euro project and is of course uh, the last bit of land sale the city of Hamburg needed in order to pay for the city and its infrastructure which you see in the front of it. I was in the jury of this competition which was super interesting because, because it was a, a competition where uh, basically the investor was competing and the investor had then um, as a uh, had then an architect and other planners as his um, uh, in his team but there are also other competitions have been decided now so this is done by Gunther Hen a highly digitalized uh, building or this is a kind of um, concrete wood hybrid um, building which is this hotel um, on the western part so at the at the end uh, of our site and also here the um, station by Gerkan Mark partner uh, almost or by now actually finished so this is a kind of um, a project on a tabula rasa you know where we could really um, um, invent everything anew. I mean, the, the street system in parts was already given, as you have seen. But other than that, we could really create the city from scratch. And towards the south in Wilhelmsburg, on this Elb island, which you have seen before, the task was actually extremely different. So here, uh, the site is the site we are working on is actually this entire portion here at the very center of the image. And the site 
became accessible because this highway, which you see here in the image center, is being moved to the edge um, of uh, the railroad tracks. And that means this core here can be completely uh, redeveloped. Uh, the Elbe Island has been flooded in 1962, so urban development actually wasn't so fast because everybody was um, a bit um, hesitant about investing in this part of Hamburg. Uh, but other parts are actually quite nice, have a, a fairly colorful, highly mixed, also demographically mixed urban life already. It has landscape parts which are actually fairly beautiful um, because over time the harbor infrastructure has been grown over uh, with greens and trees and so on. It's a place also where allotment gardens allowed a lot of people intimate, um, fairly happy lives already. So we had to really take care that we could embed ourselves in this existing situation. So what we came up with is basically, again, a kind of a nested system um, between two canals, uh, which of course were existing, where we are compressing the allotment gardens somewhat, but we need to keep them, where you still see the line of this old highway almost like a, a Roman, the memory of a Roman road embedded uh, in this neighborhood. And around that, with one new road which we are adding, we are generating now the opportunity of these new, highly differentiated um, urban blocks from fairly porous to a bit more intimate um, always with these water lines kind of um, making sure there is drainage on the one hand but also making sure that there is identity where the green is really linking together with the urban into something like this where also the idea was very important that as we have seen in the existing historic part um, of Wilhelmsburg. Also here we try to generate small units. So these big blocks we now defined as law have to be developed um, with a small grain, a grain which is organized around individual um, staircases so to speak, so that uh, always the unit of a house is still readable. So what we want to prevent is that in these areas that uh, lar a large developer could just develop this entire block and make everything the same, however well done. We really want to keep here the grain of an individual family's building, for example, like here in these more local addresses, or at least the grain of one house where the people in a staircase, sharing a staircase, still know each other. And that's then the effect, you know, that there is quite a bit of diversity um, around one of these so-called Wettern, so these uh, drainage ditches, you know, always organized again with um, threshold making which is fairly precise so that you can really live also on the ground floor and a kind of a public green which is accessible to all. Here the view in the other direction. And here by the way as a quick aside we're also building a rowing club which is great fun. So this is a project of ours uh, which we are currently working on a project which is of course not anymore now in a fairly hidden intimate green area but will be surrounded by quite a bit of public and the pressure of a lot of people. So what we're doing is we are making a building which can be completely enclosed. So if it's not used all of these sliding doors can be pulled together uh, like a turtle uh, so that 
the um, rowing club at times can be quite um, um, protected, let's say. For example, if, when you have a big event, this is the interior space with folding doors, <coughs> and then this is the boathouse looking out into the canal. And I, sh I show you a lot of projects to, to show you simil similarities in the project following this larger idea of nesting spaces, the larger idea of subsidiarity, and the careful organization of scales, right? So it's not so important. So each project on its own is not the point. The point is the projects together. That's why I'm showing you a lot of them. This next project is a competition which we didn't win in Hamburg, uh, which uh, is located in the more in one of the more established um, neighborhoods, um, which is characterized by very beautiful public parks, but also these uh, traditional uh, facades, again with a kind of a pre-zone also here, kind of carefully done. Uh, it's um, the site of Biosdorf which is the company which produces, for example, Nivea, the Nivea cream. They now have a new location and they wanted to um, develop this site um, completely new. Uh, we were not allowed to keep uh, buildings in this particular case. We actually proposed that, but they didn't want that. And here we had the task of generating a kind of a, a large block which, however, allows a lot of porosity um, in the neighborhood, so that what before was kind of enclosed and inaccessible now becomes accessible. Also here we had to add quite a bit of mass uh, in order to make uh, the business case function. So we added high-rises, but we built the high, or we proposed the high-rises in the middle of the site so that um, from the outside you have a transition from this public park, which we have seen before, to a kind of a square, then a couple of steps up to an inner alley, which is however still quite public. At this inner alley we have the plinths of these high rises, which have public functions. And then up to on top of these plinths we have housing functions. Um, Again, this kind of nesting of functions, people, um, spaces and addresses. Or also here, this kind of inner road, um, which is less accessible. So what you see here is, 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 this, is this road here, with a kind of a kindergarten um, in this part. So kindergarten kind of here with a garden, uh, kind of an, an outdoor garden on the roof. Again, um, that there is, in spite of the large mass we are adding, there is still porosity, connectivity, and at the same time a sense of neighborhood developing. Again, a similar project here uh, in uh, Germany, in Freiburg, a large greenfield development where we had to deal with rivers where we worked with the idea of very large blocks which you see here um, uh, with my mouse showing it with a, a kind of um, a moment where public uses intensify around a new core where we are adding this kind of green ring which is car free, where you basically uh, move by bike. And in that we are weaving a road network uh, for cars and are adding a tram line here uh, in the center, uh, which gives you access to a kind of a more pedestrian uh, center. So here you see this overlay of systems, you know, the, 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 um, the, the big blocks, the small blocks, the, the green ring going around the tram coming in, accessing it where there are not so many cars, and here the access from the highway uh, with the road system, and all of that um, not crossing 
so blatantly, right? So that basically the, 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 the heavy traffic and pedestrians never, uh, they cross, but they never coincide, right? For example, the green ring actually has absolutely no, tr no um, car traffic in it and so on. And that then being the uh, result. So also here, a kind of a weaving together of green and city, of infrastructural scale with the tram and the local scale uh, of the green ring, uh, and adding the car in a way that it doesn't destroy this uh, local system which we are building. Again, a similar project in Münster. Münster is interesting because it has this house logic already built into the historic fabric. Here we were working in the garden of a monastery, which is extremely beautiful. So the idea was to keep all of these trees and to keep all of these green structures and existing buildings and embed them uh, into a new kind of block structure. Again, same thing, nesting of uh, people, users, spaces and addresses. Same, same idea here in Otterbach, near Basel, a project which we won, um, where again you have a similar idea um, of scaling. Which then allows us to really weave together the green and the city and most importantly allow you to live basically in the forest, almost, right? And finally, or second finally, a kind of a project uh, which is very different, but uh, I show you because we really like it. This is a competition which we submit uh, in, a, in a few days, actually. I will present it on Monday. This is an extremely beautiful site um, at the Lake of Lucerne, where, again, we're trying to embed ourselves into a lower part along the lake road and a slightly higher uh, sequence of buildings along these more local roads um, with plants. And again, in these plants, again, you see this nesting, right? The nesting of um, the more, so now looking at one apartment of the more public spaces of um, kitchen, dining and living with a view out. And here the um, sleeping area which has a threshold, a corridor, bathrooms, so that the more private portion in an apartment is organized a bit separately from the more public functions in an apartment, uh, which is accessible here by this elevator directly or by a staircase via this threshold again. So my point being, even on the level of an apartment, we are working with the same ideas, right? Nesting, threshold, and organizing of spaces, people, and, you, and functions uh, in a kind of a fractal manner. So here are these buildings on the site um, as silhouettes, differentiated here also by the kind of... Um, a building which is one uh, large object, but at the same time we are differentiating it in section slightly to break the scale and we most importantly differentiate it also in terms of facade making so that we break the scale of this large object and are able to kind of hide it in the landscape. Here the more um, cost-effective rental apartments. So these are apartments you buy, these are apartments you rent. And then again, through this private houses, where basically all the outdoor spaces of the houses are always in the building volume, right? There are no gardens. We are not occupying the park level with private functions. So there are no sun umbrellas, hedges, 
you know, this, this entire trash of a suburban life. We don't have that. So people are in the volume, like living in this rock, because the idea is this, these are like rocks being left by some glacier um, on this green hill. So people are living here. And for the public, so for the village public, we are generating connections by having this park landscape going through from the hill to the lake um, with this path connecting everything together, giving people access from this existing boathouse, historic boathouse at the lake to a, a commun communal part organized around this barn to looking out from your house to um, a kind of a public lookout spot which gives you access to the hill view or a bit a more, a more intimate resting spot also giving access to this park and the hill view. Right, it's the weaving together of private, um, a private occupation of the land with this apartments which are bought by people but these people they don't live on the park they live next to the park and the park is given to the public in the end then generating an idea like this and even in the center of Zurich um, in a fairly um, in a, in a location right here. The same idea again, you know, the idea of generating a clear facade to the public streets, which is a bit unusual, but it's still well behaved. You know, so basically these pieces here, these volumes are due to the Zurich building law. We can only 20% of the facade, sorry, one third of the facade can actually protrude. No, sorry, 20% of the facade can protrude. Here we have the, the main intersection where we are hide and we are stepping down and we are attaching ourselves to the local scale. And then the other side is participating, participating in the courtyard of this perimeter block where all of these um, stair cases and so on give you an additional access to your apartment so you can exit your apartment on the one hand by an elevator which is hidden in, hidden in here and the staircase but you can also always use the external staircase which again links everybody so also here linking the public and the private in a way that a kind of a collective added value is being generated But embedding uh, is not only something you do with um, buildings, you embed projects also with processes. And this is the last project I'm going to show you. Embedding with processes, um, we did here with a participatory process quite extremely in this location, which is at the very center of Zurich. So this is the main station in Zurich. This is the, the rail yard kind of where, um, um, which uh, is historic. So you see here the same site um, in 1920. So this is this really prominent viaduct. This is the old uh, station of Zurich. Our site uh, is here. Um, currently it's still used to, um, uh, as a mechanical workshop to work on um, maintaining wagons and rail um, and uh, locomotives. There are historic protection issues. So for example, we need to keep, to keep this building here. We need to keep part of this building here. So here you see how it's used today. Uh, we also need to keep this um, building, which basically generates the main address to the neighborhood. And this neighborhood is very well used because it's extremely central. It has a 
very beautiful park right next to our site, the so-called Josef Wiese, the Josef Meadow. And it's a site which is very politically charged uh, because the people who live here, they have a very good neighborhood life. They also fought for this life. So this square here in the 1980s was actually planned to be a highway access to the city of Zurich. So people revolted against, they organized against it, and now they have this actually very beautiful square, which, they, which is frequently used, for example, for example, for summer festivals. So you couldn't just do a plan and then think it will be, it can be implemented easily. We had to do some participation uh, for two reasons. On the one hand, to politically legitimate the development, but on the other hand, also to hear what the people have to say, to prevent the kind of a top-down modernist way of planning, but make something which is embedded not only in terms of built volumes, addresses and, and spaces as we have been seen before, but it's embedded also in the minds of the people through their ideas and through their participation. In order to do this, we built a kind of a, a model building kit, a kind of a Lego set for um, an urban workshop. So what you see here in this kind of a pink are plinth modules uh, used as ground floors. These things here are um, building blocks for housing. We have trees, we have cars, we have people. Every um, group which was coming to participate uh, got one site model which we prepared in the office, which was actually a gigantic amount of work, it was a bit insane to do. Uh, these models we then um, discussed and had um, workshops on with uh, large groups of people. We did this for one day uh, with four groups for two days total. So we had a total of eight groups organized in two days who uh, had model parts. They had um, a board with where they could collect ideas. They had mood postcards from us to express ideas more effectively. And we then started to um, produce typologies with them. Of course, everybody wanted to make green high rises, but that was kind of fun. Uh, these, er, these first type ideas we then placed together into ensembles, into groups of buildings, which we made really beautiful. And even the um, urban planner of Zurich was very happy to photograph it. And we then placed it together. So this is all work of one day with a group of amateurs, so to speak. Brutally just telling them, look, you have one day to, um, to produce an idea. And they all succeeded. And it was interesting to see what people had in their mind. So this is the idea of a, of a Riviera along the railroad tracks, a public promenade with slightly raised, with water, with green. And then you have an alley system, and in this alley system you might even have high rises. So people are not afraid of height, they're not afraid of density, but they are afraid, people are afraid of anonymity and ghettoization and a certain urban brutality. And of course they're right to be afraid of that, they're, they're right to not want that. So this is the second team uh, where we had uh, high rises with waterfalls, where we had an embedding uh, also of the existing historic um, quarters, where we had a very large building. We had an idea of a fairly well organized uh, urban blocks. So one here, a second one, very large one uh, here, incorporating also the existing buildings. Uh, we had the idea of, of really embedding buildings also in the existing halls. 
We then took all of these ideas, this is me drawing, and we turned that into a catalog. So we produced a lot of um, uh, types, a kind of a pattern language of building typologies invented by the people. We then discussed it with them. Uh, this is the mayor of Zurich uh, gracing us with her presence, um, discussing the project as a whole. And from all of that, we then distilled a kind of an ideal solution, trying to keep as many ideas from the participation intact. So you see here the stacking of functions, the green roofs. You see keeping the uh, existing hall, um, adding a kind of a differentiated high rise to that hall. So the hall becomes a kind of a foyer. Uh, the existing hall becomes a foyer for the new high-rise. We have the very green courtyard. Again, a kind of a nesting of spaces now not invented by us, by the people. We have the um, historic train lines still visible in the public space as traces and memories. We then turned this into preliminary building law. This is a kind of a master plan where we have fairly abstract building sites and here what we call situations. Um, so for, exa for example, the situation at the tracks, right? It's kind of a, a building law with, with a narrative component, trying to keep the ideas and the narratives of the people intact. And in the end, ending up with a kind of illustration of these situations, which we invented together as a kind of a memory, which is then embedded in the final urban design, which of course still needs to be planned. So the message here is that embedding also means embedding it into these active agents of urban change, which we of course have gotten to know in the lecture Deep Cognition, right? Everybody of these, every single person is an embodied mind with the past and the future. And of course, what we need to do is to keep this organicness, to keep this ability to carry something from the past into the future, to keep this intact while we plan. So embedding is not only in time, lecture one, it is not only in space, lecture two, but it is also very much in this collective, emerging, co-evolving, embodied uh, mind, uh, which we are all sharing. So this is the first of the three applied lectures, and I hope it made sense. And I'm happy to answer questions. So guys, uh, does anyone have a uh, kind of immediate question or comment? I, know I wanted to say thank you because it's a very beautiful project and it's very interesting to look at that. Thank you. Else. And uh, second, I was like wondering when you were saying about that the fact uh, that people do not, are not afraid of the high-rise buildings and the density and the uh, but they are afraid of, uh, as you said, uh, of uh, ghettoization, right, and other things. And uh, I was thinking immediately that probably the fear is the sign of uh, the coming unknown or the correlation of the past situation that turned out to be bad. I guess that's what our society is used to do with the fear, because the fear is the sign of something. And then if you give people the narratives that they are able to process, then the fear goes away and of course they can like happily accept the project. So probably that, that was like an interesting thought that popped up in my mind when you were speaking about that. And it's exactly correct, you know, because what we have seen is that the entire history of urbanization is a history of scaling. And scaling meant that we had, on the one hand, access to ever larger scales, 
uh, but on the other hand, we also lost our roots, right? And so what we now need to ensure is that this access to the global scale, which we all enjoy, is not bought by the brutality of modernity, where everybody is um, put into uh, an anonymous a high rise sitting in an, on an anonymous urban ground, but everybody is located in a location he or she understands, is part of, has access to, is involved to some degree in governing. And at the same time, that local scale does not mean you're locked into a village, but you still are able to access the larger scales. Again, infrastructurally, politically, economically, and so on. So that's the aim, that's the goal, right? And you're completely correct. The most important thing is that the narratives of the people who are living here are kept intact or are at least enabled to a degree that people feel at home. You know, I think that's an absolutely key issue. So scale is good, yes, we all profit from it, but when scale forces us into an anonymity, then it becomes uh, problematic because then we need to react with formal means of control. And that brutality we have seen, of course, a couple of times now in my lectures, and that in the end usually tends to go wrong. So the question is perfect, I totally agree. I also have uh, one um, one comment which is basically related with the uh, question of Danila. And I think like if you look at uh, this project from a professional point of view, we will see like uh, throughout the history, right, that the very essence of the project itself uh, changes a little bit, at least like oh, what I see here in Russia and uh, what I know from uh, other countries and from my practical activities in other countries. So basically project right now is not only the element, like not only the tool of a design, but it's also a kind of a tool of negotiation and mm -hmm. storytelling. So providing people like what they need, uh, stories, and also like uh, involving all of the stakeholders and kind of, uh, so design sometimes, uh, of course it matters, but sometimes it's kind of a secondary thing, but the first thing you need to show the idea, you need to negotiate it, and you need to move this project on. Uh, so thank you so much for mm -hmm. bringing this. Yeah, or, or, or I would say it's it's a kind of a hand in hand, you know, it's, it's you need to keep both. You need to propose a project, but you also need to um, allow people to enter the narrative of the project. And, uh, you know, it was interesting, it was uh, I recently gave a virtual lecture in Kazakhstan for the Urban Forum Kazakhstan and the issue they have of course is uh, in the south of the country they have some historic cities but all of the northern part is basically Soviet cities built uh, specifically for industry and for resource extraction and all of them are organized in this uh, Soviet micro rayon structures. They're not that bad, right? Micro rayon is, is also a form of nesting, um, right? So it's, a, it's an urban quarter, you have the, the, the slab buildings, uh, you have the, 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 the kind of the public storefront towards the street and so on. So micro rayons are not wrong. Uh, but of course they're very hard, they're, they're very, um, they can be very generic and very repetitive and they can have a lack of hierarchy. And um, so one of the big questions in Kazakhstan would be how can you take this type of urban fabric and turn it into something which is again um, relocalizing people. Because the big problem of the maker rayons today is that after privatization they are actually more anonymous than they were before. Right before, when nobody locked his or her door, the micro rayons were kind of a cool place to play as a kid, you know, because you could just run through the staircases and visit everybody and so on. But now with this double and triple and quadruple locks, uh, 
it, it's, it's a very different environment, you know. The fall of the Iron Curtain brought the locking of the door of your apartment, right? It was really, so, so one lock came down, the other locks went up, you know, so, and, um, and, and, and so I think, I think, I think, you know, so this, this will be a very interesting story to, uh, to, to kind of go through and think through. in Hamburg uh, and uh, uh, I found uh, it very interesting about how you use a uh, hierarchy uh, level it was something like hierarchy super mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, but uh, you use this uh, word in uh, absolutely different uh, meaning that it's something like horizontal hierarchy not a uh, high hierarchy Um, it's, it's a good it's a good question I mean most of the hierarchy I have shown is in plan so horizontal yes correct uh, because uh, you know cities are cities are primarily organized horizontally because we move horizontally as people we understand horizontal relationships more easily than vertical relationships because we're not birds right so and in this horizontal plane the aim is to generate spaces which bring me from my apartment door, which I understand and control, to increasingly more public moments in a way where I have a sense of safety along the way. You know, the most, the most brutal way of living is when your apartment door immediately enters a completely uncontrollable public space. Um, then social relationships don't build because everybody is an anonymous number in these large apartment blocks. But as soon as you start nesting, then relationships can develop over time. And the more horizontal you organize relationships, the better this, the better this, uh, the better this nesting and the better this growth of um, or the better this avoidance of an anonymi anonymity can work. Because one of the uh, one of the uh, the relationship killers, of course, is also are also elevators, right? So elevators are anonymity generators. So that's why also uh, it is better, it is easier to to organize communities um, in 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 low rise. I mean, low rise means up to six floors or so, right? And if you build high rises, what we try to do here in our project in Neugasse is that you break a high rise into portions and you give public squares uh, in between high rise levels. You know, again, so then the hierarchy becomes verticalized also, but that's much harder to do and a, lit, a little bit more hypothetical. Maybe I have just a quick uh, question. Uh, this concept of uh, nesting comes from this concept of panarchy, right? I mean, you know, it, it's 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 the same idea. It, it it doesn't come from it. I just, you know, of course, this nesting. When you are an architect and you think about space, automatically you start thinking about groups around about thresholds, about relationships, and so on, right? And, however, what I then uh, realized is, is that this idea from systems ecology to this panarchy, ad, ad, this, um, these adaptive cycles, um, and the, the more broader idea of panarchy is basically a parallel concept, right? And in many ways, this makes total sense because, um, you know, anything is organized around localities because you know we, we are again i mean you know we are embodied minds we live on a planet which is gravity so moving takes time and is energy intensive 
So we tend to organize our lives in local ways, naturally, right? completely naturally. And that means also um, ecosystems are organized in a nested way. Obviously, it makes sense, right? And, and so in the end, there is a common cause to both. Um, but I didn't start working urbanistically in a nested way because I read that book. Let's put it like that. But I think intellectually, they are um, analog ideas and analogous ideas. And again, you know, when you go back to Polanyi, the point of great transformation, the loss of embeddedness um, in the scaling up of modernity, then of course what we now need to do is re-embedding. Um, you know, we need to make sure that we strengthen the local because the local is our best insurance against disruptions. You know, if we can make sure that local units function, it, it's basically a guerrilla strategy also. You know, if we can make sure that local units function, then some loss of connectedness is not a problem. And this is a fairly abstract idea, but you can think about it in very real terms. You know, if you have local gardens, if you have local communities, um, um, then local urban production places, then again, some degree of loss of connectedness is not such a problem, right? So it has this, it has this philosophical, even science fiction type of component in the very background. You know, and the beauty is when you look at cities which function, for example, Tokyo is an, is an extremely amazing city and an amazing experience to be there because Tokyo is, of course, an, an, a hyper metropolitan place with extremely powerful infrastructures. And nevertheless, you might move two streets away from super central places and you are in a local neighborhood, right? So Tokyo is a metropolis built of villages and that's why it's such a well-functioning place and such a pleasure to be in. You have other metropolis, you know, London is similar, for example. You have other metropolis uh, like uh, Houston or like uh, other places where these local relationships don't function and then you have this problem of an anonymity and as soon as you have an anonymity people feel unsafe as soon as they feel unsafe they don't go out the door and then cities start to be empty and lifeless moscow has portions which are extremely village-like uh, and it also has and which still function quite well but it has also portions which are in 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 incredibly brutally made and therefore highly dysfunctional. You know. Uh, how do you prevent that? Because uh, you know there are some uh, like a lot of situations where the developer is only thinking about maximizing the uh, the utility of the business, and uh, they don't uh, like have this vision. Uh, to make it uh, functional, to make it uh, embedded to the, to, the, to the community? Yeah, I mean, there are three answers. This, this is one of the key questions, right? There are three answers. One is um, bottom-up desire. So you make sure that um, uh, people have a say or, or as, a, as, a, as a community you, 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 you mobilize. The second idea is that as a state you require the developer to do certain things, so you force him by good zoning laws. But that needs a strong state, which is not always the case. The first one needs strong communities, which, which is not always the case. And as an architect working with a developer, you should also argue for uh, utility in a broader sense or for value in a broader sense. 
you know, because in the end, the resource of um, an urban development is the demands of the users. That's what you're working with, right? The better you incorporate the demand of the user rather than an abstract quantitative demand, you incorporate qualitative demands. The better you do that, the better your thing will function and the more resilient it will be in the future. It's just a well done urban development, right? And so the, the aim is to, to um, convince the developer to put mid and long term value and gain above short term gain. And there, the biggest problem is, of course, that uh, is, of course, the development process currently, which is developers producing floor areas and volume for investors. So they sell it too quickly, right? And the investor oftentimes is institutional money who is completely uninterested in, in, in long-term value because they don't think. Uh, but the danger of this short-term way of thinking is, uh, is of course, um, um, you know, the sudden loss of value or, 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 or the threat of a sudden loss of value because people just don't like it. They just don't want to live there because it sucks. So the, the, the threat of sucking is probably the best answer I can give you. Thank you very much. But again, I think, you know, in order to, I mean, you know, this short, the, the short term brutality of capital without brain is one of the biggest threats in everything we are facing right now. This is the issue, right? So it's not the capitalists, again, as I tried to show you in the Marx lecture, it's the, the, the problem is the system which forces people to lose their brain, uh, to, to think in terms of short term gain. And there, as an architect, you need to have the narrative and the intellectual toolbox in order to convince developers both of their personal individual humanity, you know, they're also people. And secondly, you need to convince them of the long-term value of something uh, which is resilient and stable because it is well built, well structured and um, not so easily, um, um, let's say, um, fragmenting. But this is hard to do. Um, and we also have been fired because we tried to do that, you know, so that's just, that's just life. But I think, I think as, as, as long as you're able to see the, the goal, then you try to argue always towards that goal. I think that's the aim, right? I see a Nur al Rotib. I'm sure you have a question. I'm, I'm hopelessly actually, mispronouncing actually, the name, no. sorry. No, no, it's okay. Actually, uh, I don't have a question, but I, I'd like to thank you for your inspiring uh, lectures. I'm an architect and actually. There has been many questions I've been asking myself and you just maybe give me some hints to, to think about it more. So just thank you. No, pleasure, of course. Good. Then uh, we can also end here. Um, as the day has been longer for you than for me because you're an hour ahead in parts at least. And um, yeah, so until next time.
Thank you so much, Marcus, for this fantastic and beautiful project and uh, this uh, inspiring ideas, as usual. Cool. All the best.